to Grace Baptist Church. We are in that period of time we refer to as Sunday school. I pray that God has prepared your heart to be schooled in the things of Christ this day. This is a most solemn, solemn message. I never knew you. The Lord Jesus Christ speaks to those with the intention of judging them, saying, I never knew you. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. I'll make a brief comment here on the will of God for his people. 1 Thessalonians has several places which address this. The will of God for us is our sanctification. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That word sanctification, as I've explained on a number of occasions, is holiness, exact same word. The will of God for his people is holiness. Later, in 1 Thessalonians, I've even sung this to you before. I'll not do that today. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Concerning you, Christian, is this what your life is surrounded by? is inundated with? Are you immersed in these things, becoming more holy day by day, rejoicing evermore, praying without ceasing, a constant awareness of God, and in everything giving thanks? Going on, the Lord Jesus says, many... And this is what we're going to be concerned with today. The many that he speaks of here, many will say to me in that day, and that day we will look at in just a moment in Matthew chapter 25, the last day. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And then, the Lord Jesus says, and then I will profess to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now I'm going to read a bit more literal translation of that last verse and use it for our study today. Verse 23, again a bit more literally. Those who said they did this and that in his name, he says, and then I will profess to them that I never knew you. Get away from me, the ones working the wickedness. This is the same Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, who will sit on the throne of his glory, accompanied by all the holy angels on the last day. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides sheep from the goats. To the sheep he will say, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
Then he will also say to the goats, Get away from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew chapter 25. What we started with in Matthew 7 verses 21, 23 through 23 is quite simply an earlier look at Matthew chapter 25. Therefore, you don't want to hear. You do not want to ever hear Christ say to you, I never knew you. Because that will be followed by Get away from me, which will be followed by an eternity in the lake of fire, the second death. Now, these are facts. You can disagree with them all you want to, but it is what will occur. This being true, and it is, we must understand the grave, the grave meaning of what Christ professed. I never knew you. First and foremost, we must understand what Christ meant in the phrase, knew you. In this context, he is speaking of an intimate, personal relationship. The kind of relationship he has with his bride, the church. Just as Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived, so the Spirit of Christ enters our hearts, uniting us to Christ. Just as the human male and female unite and become one flesh, so Christ and his church unite and become one spirit. This intimate relationship of Christ and his bride is from eternity. It always has been and always will be. It is unbreakable. This eternal intimate relationship between Christ and his church is addressed by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 1.9. God, who has saved us and called with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time eternal. In the eternal purpose of God, the church, Christ's bride, his people, have been in him for all eternity. And in time... In time, God called us. He called us inwardly by the Spirit of Christ, making us alive together with Christ spiritually in intimate union with Christ, saving us, not according to our own works, but according to his purpose and grace. By grace, we have been saved. Once again, Christ has eternally known his people. Christ has eternally known his people. He has had an eternally intimate relationship with his elect. May I repeat that again? Christ has had an eternally intimate 
relationship with his elect. If he did not know you in eternity, he will not know you in time. Known to God from eternity are all his doings. Acts 15, 18. From these truths, and they're all true, it's not hard to recognize the overwhelming importance of the word never. The people who Christ addressed here could not be among those chosen of God in Christ before time eternal if, in fact, Christ never knew them. To repeat, if Christ did not know you personally in eternity, he will not know you in time, nor in the eternity that will follow. The word never from the voice of the eternal Son of God has eternal significance, eternal consequence. As we live in time, we have a difficulty dealing with eternally speaking. Indeed, now listen up, indeed the most, the most significant word found in our title I never knew you, is without doubt or controversy. The most significant word in that title. It is the first word. The personal pronoun, I. I never knew you. There is a saying that uh, I've heard, and I've used it a number of times in my own life. It's not what you know, but who you know. You know, they say that in the business world all the time. When it comes to life eternal, that saying is absolutely true. And there's nothing more important than life eternal. Now, this is the eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17, 3, Christ praying to the Father. And please remember, that not only means knowing about God, and we need to know about God, we need to know about God the Father and God the Son, but also knowing them in a vital union, vital union, a life-giving relationship brought about in the new birth, sent by God the Father in the person of the Spirit of His Son, Jesus Christ, who lives in our very souls. When I say lives in our very souls, of course. I'm speaking of Christ's bride, the church. This being true, and again, it's true. We have communion. We have fellowship with the eternal God. Paul's second letter to the saints at Corinth ends with this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit accompany all of you. Paul prays that for the saints at Corinth. And of course, that would be inclusive of all Christians as we read the scripture. True Christians 
received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Romans 8, verses 15 and 16. Folks, we know God by relationship. Eternal relationship. Of course... The eternal God first knew us before we knew him. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, conformed to the image of his son. Of course, the foreknowledge spoken of there is from eternity, proving Clearly, that God knew us first. This foreknowledge was based upon the love of God for his elect. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us in eternity and eternally. Jeremiah 31.3, he's loved us with an everlasting love. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. We love him because he first loved us. And we know him because he first loved us knew us. I'm going to read from the book of Romans, showing us the, the stability of the love of Christ for his elect. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God for that. Eternal truth. Christ's love for his people has no end. This is the same Christ of Matthew chapter 25 that we read earlier. The same Christ who will be the judge of the quick and the dead at the last day. It is beyond all importance. It is beyond all important that this Christ does not say to you or me, I never knew you. The immediate context of our title gives us clear warning. Let's look again. What we began with today and see if we can expand a bit upon it and understand it a bit better. After professing, I never knew you, the eternal Son of God, the eternal and final judge of the universe, the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords says, get away from me. The only hope 
of salvation for those of the human race, saying, get away from me and not come unto me. That's a death sentence, folks. That's a death sentence unto the second death. Eternal torment in the lake of fire. Now remember, in that day that Christ says that is speaking of the last day. As God, Jesus Christ, pronounces what he knows is in the hearts of these people, acted out in their lives. I never knew you. Get away from me, the ones working the wickedness. The word working there is a present participle. These are people working presently and continually. The word working means being engaged in being occupied with presently and continually. They are being engaged in and being occupied with wickedness. They are living in sin presently and continually. Now, folks, I know in this religious world, human beings are fooled by appearances but God knows the individual human heart Christ is not fooled by the ones who say with their lips Lord Lord Isaiah 29:13 Inasmuch as these people draw near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me. They draw near with their mouths, but Christ responds with, get away from me. Some may then point to Matthew 7, 22, and argue these people were not all that evil. I want us to examine that a bit more closely. Matthew 7, 22, at that last day, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. First, Christ's judgment that these people were wicked is a righteous judgment. John 5.30, Christ says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear I judge, and my judgment is just. Exactly the same Greek word is righteous. My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Then a bit later in John's gospel, John 8, 16, Christ said, If I do judge, and he will, my judgment is True. Though these people may have performed some supposedly wondrous acts, take heed to what Proverbs 21.4 says. The plowing of the wicked is sin. That's plowing a field, folks. The plowing of the wicked is sin. Plowing a field is not in and of itself a wicked act. But the wicked heart of the one plowing renders the act of plowing sinful while being performed by 
the wicked. That's why the plowing of the wicked is sin. Remember what God said to Adam in the garden? When he had sinned? Cursed is the, is the ground. Cursed is the ground for your sake. The ground has no sin in it. But for Adam's sake, it became cursed. Lastly, let's consider a phrase, these false professors, false professors of Christ used three separate times. Listen to this very, very closely, folks. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons. In your name. And done many, many wonders in your name. In your name. This is the bedrock of their claims. They are, now listen, they are presuming upon what they have taken for granted without Spiritual understanding. To do anything truly in Christ's name is to be truly representing Him. If you truly represent Christ, you must be authorized by the Holy Spirit to do so. And I can prove that beyond any shadow of doubt especially with what these people say. Remember, they also said, Lord, 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 twice. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one, how many people does that leave out? And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Lord, Lord rang empty to Christ from those people because it did not come by the Holy Spirit. Folks, Christ is one with the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of Christ. It is the Spirit of the Father. They are united perfectly. I don't understand that. That's the way that it is. Romans 8, 9. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, that one is not of him. Now that's a proper translation. The King James says, is none of his. That's not real good. If you look it up in an inner linear, you can see what I'm saying. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, that one is not of him. Romans 8, 9. That means that one is not a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're not of God. You've not been created anew by God There is no intimate spiritual relationship between that one and the Lord. He does not recognize, nor does he agree with any claims they make because they are not of him. They were never intimately united to him. He Never knew them. I surely hope you're getting the gist of this. To those who profess to know Christ. I profess to know Christ. Do you profess to know Christ? Don't presume upon your profession. And God forbid... We take Christ for granted. 
to whom much has been given, from that one much will be required. If you are of the mind to stand at the last day and make false claims concerning your religion before the Lord Jesus Christ, he has already given you his judgment. And we've seen it today. His judgment? Get away from me. I never knew you. Amen. 